In this video, you'll learn how you can design for our collective well-being and for the good life. By looking beyond our Western ways of knowing, doing, and being. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hola, I'm Diana. This is the Service Design Show, and this is episode 180. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are all those hidden and invisible things that make the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and obviously our planet. Our guest in this episode is Diana Alberon Gonzalez. Diana is a lecturer at the University of Auckland and she did a fantastic PhD thesis titled Towards a Buen Vivir Centric Design Decolonizing Artisanal Design with Mayan Weavers from the Highlands of Chiapas, Mexico. The reason I'm excited to have Diana on the show with us today is because we're going to broaden the perspective on the common discourse around design. Because what you hear and read about design these days, including here on the show, is mostly driven by a Western and academic perspective. That's a perspective that's been highly influenced by industrialization and consumerism. And we all know what trouble that has got us into. Fortunately, there are other ways of approaching design, ways that are maybe less well-documented and maybe considered to be less scientific, but equally valuable. These ways offer a much needed alternative and enrich our common perspective on design. Diana has extensively studied these other ways of approaching design, and she has discovered that they can lead to solutions that are much more aligned with the local culture and environment. And that's not all. These alternative ways of approaching design also allow qualities like our collective well-being and the good life to flourish. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll know how you can overcome the current limitations of our design process. Why it's crucial that we first acknowledge the power and privilege we hold as designers. And finally, how you can use these alternative ways of knowing, doing and being to become a more well-rounded professional. I hope you're just as excited as I am for this upcoming conversation. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Diana Albron Gonzalez. Welcome to the show, Diana. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, obviously I wanted to talk to you because this is going to be a very interesting topic that we're going to discuss. And it's always nice to have a guest from all the way from New Zealand, the opposite side of the world from where I am. Um, Diana, before we jump into the topic of today, uh, we would love to know a little bit more about you, your context, what do you do these days? Um, so could you share a bit about that with us? Yeah, my name is Diana, Diana Barran Gonzalez. Uh, I know in English speaking countries, they call me Diana, but I always prefer Diana because I'm from Mexico, uh, so Spanish speaker. Um, and then, yeah, I've been in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, New Zealand for the past eight years. And I'm, I'm a lecturer in the Waipapata Matarau, which is the University of Auckland hmm. in the design program. Yep. Oh, wow. And uh, which uh, is there, of course, there is like lecturer on which subject, with to which topics do you teach? Yeah, um, I teach in the design undergrad and postgrad. And um, yeah, mostly I'm in charge of the year three, the last year. So I teach design methodologies, design research methodologies for undergrad and postgrad. And yeah, PhD supervision as well. Mm. And uh, you mentioned that you uh, have been in New Zealand for 
the last eight years. How did you end up in New Zealand? Oof, that's a long story. Well, actually, <laughs> New Zealand is my fifth country living overseas. So I've been here and there. So I've been, I studied my master in Spain, and then I had a scholarship to spend a few months in, uh, nine months in Japan. Then I live in Singapore, um, and then I end up here. So, yeah, mm. between studies, family plans, and then Yeah, we end up here. And then here I started teaching in the university, well, in another university for a while. And then I started a PhD there. Mm. So, yeah, that's just go with the flow. Curious, well, (laughs) where you'll end up next. Is there something on your bucket list? I would never say never, but I don't know. Canada, it's always been kind of like "Hmm," on my radar because it's kind of in my family in Mexico because they're still there so but who knows we'll check in in a few years uh, <laughs> Diana um, I'm going to try to pronounce it in uh, the more Spanish way than the uh, English way um, I know that you've been listening to a few episodes so you know what's coming we have a lightning round with five questions that you haven't prepared for um, just to get to know you even better as a person next to the professional are you ready? Yep. All right. Let's start with the geographical question. If you could work from anywhere in the world, now that you've seen so many places, which place would you like to be? Ooh, I don't know if any particular country, but definitely being near the water and near nature is something that I really love. So Mm. anywhere near the sea will be good. Mm. All right, uh, we'll mark that one down. Next mm. question is, if you could recommend a book for us all to read, which book would you recommend? Oh, hard to pick only one. <laughs> there's, uh, there's quite a few, but design related or in general? It can be in general. Oh, well, speaking about co-design and because personally, um, being in the same network, Beyond Sticky Notes by K.A. Um, McCurcher, but I think mm. that's how that's her name. Yeah, Beyond Sticky Notes, it's about co-design. So I think that's the thing that comes to my mind recently. Well, add that one to the reading list down below. Uh, our third question is a classic one. What's always in your fridge? Oh, hot sauce. <laughs> Mexican, <laughs> so I need, I need hot sauce. All right, all right. And uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? I wanted to be a zoologist. I wanted to study animals, observe Mm. them. Yep. Mm. Cool. And uh, fifth and final question uh, is, do you recall the moment that you learned about service design? Yeah, I was thinking about it when while Mm -hmm. listening to the other podcast, and I think it was at the end of my master. And it was around 2007. Um, I did my master in Spain. And I was exploring at that time uh, experience design. So, yeah, I, I was reading I think Nathan Shedroff and the, and the notion of having, thinking about experience and design relationship with time before, during, after, all of that. Mm. And that led me to, to um, yeah, service design later on. So quite a long time ago, if that's uh, around the period. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Um, always interesting to hear uh, the things that you do not read on a CV, on a link or a mm-hmm. LinkedIn profile. <laughs> so let's dive into today's topic. Um, I would say uh, by the term that you've introduced to me we haven't addressed it yet but we've uh, sort of scratched on the surfaces of this in some other episodes um you uh, i'm going to summarize it and uh, help me to uh, correct if it's not uh, right designing with when vivir mm-hmm. designing for collective well-being mm-hmm. right um yeah. And plural ways of knowing, doing, and thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, plural ways of uh, yeah knowing, doing, and being. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. fun. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, maybe the term, and I'm going, again, I'm going to butcher it, Buen Vivir. Yeah. What's no. that all about? And how did that get on your radar? Yeah, Buen Vivir. Uh, buen means good. Vivir is like living, uh, good living. Um, it's a term in, that you can find in Latin America. Um, originally, it came, it's more linked to uh, Sumacausai, Sumacamaña, which are um, Andean, Quechua, and Aymara ways of a, a, a good life, a mm-hmm. quality, good quality of life, simple life. And it's been used uh, in the constitutions in Ecuador and um, Bolivia. So it's it's known, it's kind of a philosophy from indigenous communities. However, like Buen Vivir is a term in Spanish, but it's being used, uh, let's say it's kind of an umbrella term that unites because different indigenous communities in different parts of the world, at least in Avia Yala, that's the um, una, a name of the American continent, Different communities have different ways of different philosophies of Buen Vivir. Like, for example, I, I work alongside Mayan weavers, so Tzil and Celtal weavers from Chiapas, that's the state that I'm from in south of Mexico. And, for example, for them, their Buen Vivir could be, it's Lequil Kuslejal. Lequil is, is good. Kuslejal um, is life. So, yeah, different indigenous communities have these ways of Buen Vivir. So that's that's how I end up. This isn't a topic that's on everybody's radar. How did you uh, develop an interest in exploring this and connecting this to design? Um, it's been used, like when we in a way, it's an alternative to development, but development from a Western perspective. So, um, yeah, like in, in, in Latin America, it's, it's a concept that has been growing in, in popularity or, or knowledge. Uh, it's being more widespread. And so when I was doing my PhD, uh, I was starting my PhD um, focusing on artisanal design. That's a, a field in, in Latin America, in different Latin American countries as a space where designers and artisans collaborate. So I was exploring that alongside, yeah, this this uh, collective of, of weavers. And while working together, we started, um, yeah, after I think it was after the first field research that, because it's attached sometimes with sustainability and, and other practices. And then, but in a way, they come from a kind of a Western global North view of development and sustainability and all of that. So I, yeah, in our conversations and in our work together, uh, we were, I was wondering how, what is, what is the one we be from them? What is the, the, the good quality of life that is attached to the work that they do? So yeah, like just by talking to, um, and working together, then I realized that part of the, that's, when I knew about Le Quilcus Lejal, which was the, the similar to the, the Buen Vivir, another alternative of, of Buen Vivir for them. So that's how we started exploring that. And that led to the, the, the even the title of the thesis, like towards a Buen Vivir centric design. So we, we started to explore how designing or Buen Vivir would look like as a harmonious coexistence of yeah diverse beings with naked nature, culture, and Mother Earth, and all of that. So having a different logic of design. This concept, um, you, you're, in my, in my perspective, you're putting this next to or um, opposite to what you define as Western design philosophies or Global North design philosophies. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, what are the differences? And um, yeah. Worldviews. Or, or we exist within the way we operate or the way that we see um, even design. And at, at least design education has been attached more, even, even regardless where you are, it's attached a lot with Western uh, knowledge or uh, European or um, from the US. 
So even though I study in, in Mexico, uh, industrial design as my degree, I still learn about the Bauhaus and all of these design um, approaches that reflect a very particular way of doing design. So yeah, in the last maybe decade or in a few like, years, there's this questioning of if that's the only type of design that it exists, because sometimes, even for me, it was a kind of a cognitive dissonance. Because when you learn about like color theory and all of these other ways of what good design is, when you see a reality, it's like someone from the global south or Latin America, like Mexico. But I also saw that like living in other places like Singapore. And so the things that you learn as what good design is, it kind of clashes with what we see every day in our, in our context, in the different parts. So in a way that kind of, I'm not, I'm not the only one questioning this, of course. And there's other people and other scholars like saying like, what design do exist in our context with indigenous communities, for example, as ancestral knowledge, but it's just not called that way. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was kind of trying to open this space or just di direct the gaze that actually other designs do exist. Other ways of designing do exist. It's just not acknowledged as such. And acknowledged by who in this case? Academia, uh, even in design programs, design education, like we barely just do the exercise. I invite everyone to do the exercise. Just Google good design or good designer or famous designer. And you won't see a lot of um, diversity <laughs> in that, in that, in those results. Mm -hmm. It shows kind of a, a view from a yeah, modern colonial worldview. So in a way, I think I'm, I want to believe, I want to think that I'm part of this movement of, of, of designers or scholars who are bringing the attention that actually I, there are other ways of designing that are more aligned to different contexts, different places. For example, because I live in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I can see that here that Maori design, it's a thing, you know, like it's not, it's, it's uh, acknowledged and it's recognized and it's aligned to Te Ao Maori, Maori worldview. So that's something that I learned a lot by being here too. And I think it, it, it was a, a big point of difference of doing the PhD here in Aotearoa rather than doing it somewhere else. So... And this uh, limited and maybe narrow perspective on design or how it's documented, how it's communicated right now. Um, what's what's the consequence of that? As in, what are we missing or what's ha what's not happening through the fact that we're just having a very, well, yeah, maybe narrow lens? Well, first enough let's say from a social justice perspective or environmental justice as well or an, like from a justice lens um design as it is now or hegemonic design let's call it um it, it leaves a lot of people out so sometimes it designs for just for the 10 percent five percent of the population so at the end there's a lot of people that are are actually left out Mm. in current design or the environment. The environment is, is used as a resource to be exploited. And we know the consequences of those behaviors. So at the end, I think it's important that we integrate all of these other worldviews that are a little bit more aligned to, um, yeah, more responsible, uh, more... Uh, not only human, but for example, I talk also a lot of, about values. And, and in Latin America, there's a, um, a concept called sentir pensar. Uh, sentir is feel, pensar is think. From, well, recognized by uh, for Colombian scholar uh, sociologist Orlando Falls Borda, that for us, us uh, we need to feel, think at the same time to make sense. That is, it contrasts from you know, like this thinking approach or like, uh, I think therefore I am like 
from other worldviews, like from our context, is that's different. And also uh, Corazonar, that's also aligned to um, indigenous worldviews from Navayala, from the Americas, and, and also aligned with the Mayan thought and Mayan knowledge. So Corazonar, to hearten the thought or to co-reason. Some scholars, uh, they said to think with the heart and to uh, think with the head and feel with the heart. So at the end, there's other approaches of doing design that are not disconnected to the, you know, like with scientific approaches of objectivity that you disconnect from people and you disconnect from the ob object or subject of study, while other ways of working alongside people that are more, um, yeah, aligned with our humanity. And more integrated, maybe? with our situational, more even more context-aware? Yeah, place-based, they're situated in a context, they acknowledge our own biases. Like, um, there's a concept that I use, uh, that I created in the, for the, in the thesis that is um, called a 3PA, power, politics, privilege, and access. So our position as designers in different contexts, depending on how we are perceived or where we are located, it varies our power, it varies our privilege, the access that we can have to think to things. So I could I could experience that that came out of my own lived experience as a migrant woman of color in Aotearoa in New Zealand, uh, doing a PhD on a scholarship, you know, like that grant me access, different access and deep and less power related to. But when I was going to, to my country to doing field work in a way doing a PhD in a English speaking country in a so-called first world. And I quote obviously that word. Um, so it really opens and give, gave me access to spaces just by doing that, even though I'm from there, you know, like, so this changing of, of situation of places and positionality really make that uh, more evident to me. So that's that's why I think it's important as designers that we are aware of this, the power that we have, the access that we have, the privilege that we have to be more responsible of, of our approaches rather than abuse that power. Uh, it's more like, how can we balance that? And actually, uh, especially when we work alongside communities, how can we work alongside communities in a way that is responsible and ethical and that we balance those those things rather than just benefit from them. Do you feel, uh, because that's a loaded question, do you feel currently design is positioned and educated as a way to benefit and maybe extract and exploit our communities? I, the reason I'm asking this is that's not a general notion that I'm hearing when I'm talking to the design community. Right? Most people who get into this space are really passionate, want to do good for the world. So there's a lot of positive motivation going on there. So I'm curious, like, where do you see, how, how is this playing out? Yeah, there's, for example, where contexts are from and, and, and Chiapas, like as a, there's so many NGOs and people with good intentions, which is great. You know, like that's, I think that's a, a lot of the, the, the starting point. Like for example, I started my PhD thinking about social design. I wanted to approach through a social design lens. But then while doing the field work and being there, I realized like many say that they do social design and, and actually they do. However, using a, a decolonial lens, that would it really help to shift and bring into awareness matters of, for example, intellectual property, ownership of knowledge. So while... Yes, there are good intentions of collaboration, for example, with indigenous communities. But many times, depending who's the funder, the IP becomes part of the funders of, or part of, like, for example, uh, uh, artisan designers collaboration. Sometimes those knowledges are actually registered and to be appropriated by external uh, or NGOs or academia or all the ways that, but if we think about the UNESCO and the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights, the designs, patterns, and all of that are part of indigenous rights 
of indi- or the, the rights of indigenous peoples. So, you know, the, so there's good intentions, but there's also a lot of systems that are designed to benefit more certain groups than others. So I think it's very important that we not only come, it's great that we have good intentions, but we need to also be aware of these power relationships and all of the complexities of systems that benefit some people more than others. Mm. And especially when we work with marginalized communities, like historically marginalized communities, we have a, a big, I think our sense of responsibility should be greater than. And how does that... Um... How does that greater sense of responsibility manifest itself? Like, wh- how do we how do we need to change our approach, our attitude, our thinking? Um, oof, I think that's also a kind of a between a personal journey because depending on our position, our positionality, and our situation, again, we will have more or less power, access, privilege, and all that stuff. So. At the end, I think that will be a good, a good first approach that I've seen in from well from feminist uh, approaches, feminist theories, decolonial theories, indigenous. It's to start by positioning yourself and re- positionality, recognizing all of these, um, yeah, powers and 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 that are coming to play, because um, so we can. Ba- uh, bal- trying to balance them, you know, like um, also related to bias, you know, like unconscious bias is something that is wired <laughs> already, but being aware of those biases can help you to try to balance them. So uh, exploring these things on a personal level, I think it's important as as designers, especially if we really want to do good. Like exploring your biases and understanding um, the power that you have, like which position you take in in the system, are those examples of things that are missing in sort of the Western design philosophy that people, I don't know, maybe look more at the uh, process-oriented perspectives of the design craft and not so much on the things that we just mentioned is that, is that an example of things that are missing in the western design philosophy if we think about the design history design history because i i, I teach that part those parts in the in in here if we think about design uh, like for example the origin of all design methods and tools they're attached or they emerge from on a particular time like 60s 70s and it's related to design as science so they have this notion of objectivity and you can predict and all of that stuff so they emerged from that part until like well later on they were like um you know like sean uh donald sean or sean um talking about the reflexive practitioner you know like there was another wave of of designers and creatives who were questioning that approach as a science design as science Mm -hmm that it was more attached to engineering, but also like talking about um, intuition, experience, all of those things. So it's not necessarily that it's like, oh, all Western mm-hmm. approaches don't have that. However, we need to recognize and acknowledge the origin of all this and why they maybe they are not, um, they are not there at the beginning. But, but uh, fortunately, there's many, many, uh, researchers, and you have a few in your show already, who are approaching things differently, and that that gives me always a lot of hope. And that's mm. that's for example in as a as a design educator, I try to when I give examples of what what's being done um, around the world, I try purposely I try to bring these examples from places that are not necessarily. Uh, from the um, actually minority world, we call it the global majority or the global south. So to make visible this these initiatives that they already exist, and and I collaborate with researchers from different parts of the world, and also well, especially now as Australia, that we're trying to bring all of this and and share resources for other design scholars because sometimes it takes a lot of time when you look for examples or cases around the world, normally what you find are mainly from Europe or the US on, on, on 
and it, it takes time and it, it requires an effort to really try to diversify the curriculum as well. But again, there's many, many um, emerging resources uh, you can find online, even from the US, from Canada, that are bringing these other ways of, of doing design. So it, it gives me hope. <laughs> I'm I'm really curious. I don't know if you sort of know by heart, but like, what are some of these examples that um, that you see resonate with people? Where when you share this, people go like, ah, now I get it, or ah, yeah, now I see the gap that exists. Are there any sort of iconic or stereotypical examples that you revert to? Um, not stereotypical, but but just being in Aotearoa being in New Zealand, like Maori, Maori design and, and tell Maori and the influences, like it's, it's, it's here. So we, we, I show and bring those things. Uh, I'm in the Netherlands, so I have no clue. What is it that you show and what is it that you see around you? Yeah, I will talk about people that I know and that are amazing designers, Maori designers, or this, uh, for example, uh, organization called Naaho Maori Design. That is a network of Maori practitioners, creatives, designers, architects, and, and they're doing amazing work on indigenous design. So because they 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 design based on their worldviews. So that network. Um, then um, well from Aotearoa, that will be. Mar eh, Naho, then Iria, indigenous design, like with Johnson with Tejira. And yeah, there's Nafanga Sholum. There's many in Aotearoa. And then there's also uh, through through them and through indigenous design, I've met um yeah, architects and, and designers and creatives from, for example, from Turtle Island in Canada, uh, and in the US, architects, um, that they are. The way that they approach design or architecture or whatever field they are, it's based on indigenous worldviews that resonate mm. and work alongside, and they collaborate differently. Um, then from yeah, from Latin America as well. There's a lot of push uh, as well, bringing, for example, um, design from a feminist design from a gender lens. There, there are programs in Argentina and in Mexico too, like push to bring. Um, gender a gender lens into design um oof. yeah just to mention some yeah so um in essence the outcome of this design process could be i don't know a building a place a, a service and I'm, I'm just trying to make it tangible for myself this could be i don't know a healthcare service for the elderly but designed with in a way which is more aligned with the context the situation indigenous ways of knowing rather than following a more uh, let's, again let's generalize it, a western uh, uh, academia based design process and the outcome could be again in both cases you might have a healthcare service for the elderly one is going to be more aligned with the community, the other one less. Is I don't know. Is that a simplified summary here? Yeah, like for example, here in the in the New Zealand context again, Aotearoa, uh, the we talk about well being, like related to well being, right? Health and well being. Like the Ministry of Health acknowledges, and you can find on the on official websites, acknowledge uh, Hawora. Hawora is like the Maori well being, and and they have different models. For example, one is called Te Fare Tapa Fa. Fare is house, uh, Tapa is the sides, Fa is four. So they make an analogy of a fare, of a house, of a well being of a person, come from Maori worldview. So, for example, you have Tahatinana, which is the body, Taha Wairua, the spirit, Taha Fana, family and community, and Taha Hinenaro, mind and emotions. Mm. So they, from based on Teo Maori, uh, Maori worldview, it's like a person's well-being is like a house. You can have a standing house if one of the sides are not in balance. So, and that's part of the. You can find it on the in the in the health, um, yeah, Ministry of Health in New Zealand. So acknowledging mm -hmm. ways that 
for, for Maori, um, Tangata Fenua, the well-being of a person is not only the physical, it's all of these other dimensions that are important to acknowledge. Another example is, for example, in housing. Uh, sometimes when you when you build houses, you build based on a nuclear type of family, you know, like you have even even gender, like parents, mm -hmm. kids, how many. But if you think about uh, Pacific here, like different uh, Pacific communities from Samoa, Tonga, because there's a big Pacific communities here in Aotearoa, and of being in the Pacific too, Maori too, that structure, that family structure that is only within nuclear family, family is actually not the reality for many. You have intergenerational households, which is like actually that's something that I saw in Singapore as well. Like the public housing now, they're trying to do this type of living that are, um, you know, like intergenerational houses. So there are small departments that are kind of attached. So you have the, the grandparents living next to next to the family. So, you know, so if, if it's very culturally responsive of ways of being rather than having this approach of what I think it's a, a family looks like, actually it's acknowledging that there's all kinds of families, sizes and intergenerational that are part of a culture of, of approaching living. So having this awareness of, different cultures and different worldviews is actually beneficial and it's more appropriate to the context and, and people. What I find interesting here and still sort of uh, hard to grasp from what I know from the Western design practice and the things that I've been exposed to most is a good designer will do user research, will try to understand the needs and desires, will try to hopefully understand the world views of the people the communities they are designing for is like what's what's lacking there why do you feel that that's um that that's not enough sometimes it could be transactional or it could feel a bit transactional that that even the perception the language that we use as user as something that you're detached but design in other parts of the world are is more or communities are more relational Mm -hmm. So more than project based that you finish and then you're gone and then they never see you again, or you, you touch into different communities and then you disappear. And then the communities that you work with, or they never hear about the results <laughs> or because that happens sometimes, sadly. So it's like more like a top down approach where, okay, we just consult a lot of people. And then we get the information and we, we make the decisions and we take this, make the decisions based on what we know. Well, if you think about reciprocity, if you think about relations, these things are more long-term. It's not only a transactional for like very short period, but it's something that it grows through time. So it of course it requires longer. It requires decision-making together. It requires all the ways of collaboration that are rather than yeah like extractivist of the information that i need and then i make all the decisions it's like you you involve people in you bring people in to dream together mm. to create together so the outcomes that, and also people when are involved they can take ownership of these things and they they it's a, a capability building there's there's all the ways of be, of relating to people i think as well that is in a way, it becomes also personal, at least in my experience. Yeah, so uh, the power dynamic is one thing, for instance. And the, the designer who has the power to make the decisions and who, I don't know, tries to approach things from a... Even though when they use uh, empathy and sort of intuition, try to make it sort of scientific, they still are in the position of power, of leading the design process while what you're describing is even a more humble position of the designer. Um, and that's already, that's that's going to make a huge difference, obviously. Yeah, like we can see approaches of that it's, it's shifting the role of the designer, right? Like mm -hmm. from an expert to more like a facilitator of processes. That's, that's a shift that we've seen in design practice. But also I think, as you said, it's a matter of power sharing. 
And it's a matter of knowing and recognizing people that they are the expert of their leave. Their leave experiences count a lot and they are the expert of their own lives. So our roles are starting to shift. So compared to where I started to study, like industrial design, like many, many years ago, there's a big shift. Um, but also that's why it comes from a sense of responsibility. You know, like ethics, it's something that it needs to be up in the front more. I, my, for example, my critique about thinking and empathy as a stage on a design process is rather than it has to be all along. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not something that you perform in a certain stage. It's, it's, it's an approach. It's a way of being. That's why I'm talking like pure ways of being, because at the end, the way that we relate to people is not only when we are gathering information, but it's, it's a long way where we make decisions as well that it might not be, um, let's say, aligned to the founder fully. <laughs> but could be the, the more responsible thing to do. Mm. So sometimes it's hard because sometimes what I've experienced, sometimes it's just saying no. When I get approached to certain things and I think that it's not the right thing to do, I just have to say no. Mm-hmm. I'm not the right person for this. What do you say to uh, service design or design professionals who are in a reality where they work and live and operate in a pretty industrialized civilization very uh driven by creating stuff or creating services like that's how design is is mostly being used to put out things that people want to buy or improve public services but it, it, there is a very industrialized way of using design and when you share this story, does it resonate? Are they able to to translate that in <laughs> in their context, in their situation? I think we all can contribute to change systems, whatever we are. Because even for me, the, 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 it was a it kind of put me on hold and for a while while doing like starting the PhD, and I was using decolonial theory or decolonization. And then it's like, well, academia is one of the most colonizing institutions or fields. So I I felt this paradox and it's like, whatever I do, I will be, you know, like, but um, I used the, the principles, the principles of leading by obeying the mandar obedeciendo from the Zapatista um, movement. And one of the, they have seven principles and one, it says, uh, construir, no no destruir, like to, to build and to construct, not to destroy. So that really helped me a lot to say, there's always ways to create alternatives. So this, it takes time and effort, of course, and so, and it's not easy, but that's why, for example, well, sustainability is something that when I was studying, it was kind of a postgrad or a view that it was not even, it was very marginalized still. And now everyone knows what sustainability is and want to change things and systems and products and ways of doing because of the need of doing this. You know, like we are in a world that, in a stage in the world that we, we need to take action. And I think there's always ways that we can do and take action. And even with small changes that we do um, in in the place that we are, just, for example, saying no. If we are offered products or we're offered things that doesn't feel right, they don't feel right, or we see that they are not, they will oppress people, they will marginalize more, we can always say no. And that's a good start even. And just and just even um, passing that project, like, you know, like I'm not the right person because this is working alongside these communities, but I have, I know someone who's great and is part of that community that maybe, you know, like, or bring them in, bring them into the project. Like if you, but um, something that I learned here that I like is whole space. It's not for us to, to, if we're in a position of 
power a little bit and access for a project that it will be alongside communities. So hold the space, but bring people in so they can act and they can do rather than us telling what to do. It's more like, okay, if I'm in this position, I will just hold space for communities to do what is more appropriate for them. Mm. So there's there's always little ways that we can do that. What I find really fascinating and interesting from our conversation, and this is and this is already going to be my takeaway, like when I again look at how design is uh, practiced educated thought there's very much um, a, a, a god syndrome like we can create we can shape the world we are uh, and, and especially when you're dealing with uh, design crafts that do work with tangible aspects graphic design visual design product design you really do have that makers instinct you want to sh shape the world mm -hmm. <clears throat> what i'm getting from your reflection um is that that's great but at the same time it's also very important to understand your limitations and know when like when you should like, like you said say no or call in somebody else or recognize that uh, it's not your position it's not your moment it's not your skill to to shape this and and because you might be you might be doing more harm un unconsciously by getting involved in in a specific challenge that's not aligned with that community does that make sense yep you summarize like <laughs> so um what have you found is the most difficult thing to i don't know if explain is the right word but to get across uh, about this topic i i normally start for example when i talk uh lecture or give talks or, or or workshops or whatever it is i start a little bit with a disclaimer and i started a disclaimer in a sense that i invite people to um reflect and think and i have like for example if it's a workshop just i have a section in somewhere there so they can write what they're going through the emotions and because sometimes when we realize especially when you talk about power and privilege when we realize that we have more power than or we are privileged than it can come as a sense of guilt mm. or shame or like, oh, or even you put um, an emotional reaction that put people in defense and block. So I kind of, before starting, I, I not sometimes, well, normally, commonly, I, I start with this disclaimer, or this invitation for people to think like the, the topics that we're going to talk, it might be triggering for some people. And I said, I invite you to, whatever you're going through and you're feeling, first stop and think about it, take notes. Uh, what are you feeling? What are the thoughts in your head? Where does it feel? Like sometimes like, oh, you know, like in the stomach or heart or sweating or whatever it is, just take notes. Just don't react. Don't respond because sometimes when, yeah, um, I have a, a kind of a phrase there where it's like, uh, when some groups benefit more than others because history of marginalization. And then I would say um, people that a common response is, it's not my fault. It's not my fault that my grandparents or my ancestry did this. It's like, yes, it's not my fault, but we do benefit from systems that oppress some people and benefit us. So in a way it's, we are responsible. So I, I, I have this slide at the beginning. So yes, just observe when you're triggered, why you're triggered, take notes, reflect, and in your own time, think about these things. Why do you think you're triggered? Why do you think this is, is touching you? And then once these emotions go through, what are you going to do about it? Because yes, it, it is not our fault that we, I didn't choose to gender, 
race or ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, country. Like I, we didn't choose anything when we were born, but we do benefit in certain ways or, or not. So what am I going to do about it? That's a really interesting question. And uh, it's very tempting to go deeper into that. But uh, that kind of reflection and um, putting away the, or not putting away, experiencing that resistance, feeling it deeply, um, and then uh, trying to do better and acknowledging that uh, everybody is in this position one way or the other. Everybody has some sort of power, privilege, whatever benefit. Uh, so, and that's, as long as I think, as you recognize that everybody has this, it's okay. Like it's not, it's almost not personal. Um, what is your hope for the future? I think that we are more connected to ourselves personally, but in, in as a whole self, you know, um, I talk about in, in the, in the research, in the thesis, talk about embodiment, mm -hmm. you know, like to really being in our bodies, being present. So, um, that we are more aware of all of these things and, and, and that moves us to th make things better from, uh, Buen Vivir. <laughs> from a when we build perspective, like collective well-being, like how can we not only think or, on our own when we build, or our own well-being personal, because sometimes when we think about well-being or wellness, it's very centered on a, on a personal level, but actually we're part of a community. Humans are part of, of, of the planet, uh, of nature. And, and I, I always emphasize nature culture as a unity, like aligned to indigenous worldviews, because this, this culture comes from environment like the nature and all of that stuff so it's like if we yeah that will be my hope like that we can think and and act for a collective well-being in many dimensions of wherever we are if somebody is inspired by our conversation and wants to learn more about this um are there any good resources that you can recommend yeah i think there's some work from other scholars like um yeah, I'm I'm starting to write more about this as well outside like uh but not only academic papers, but just um they can start with getting inspiration by people around them, their communities, their families. Just you be more present and really listen more and be more in touch with nature as well. Like uh, for me, that's my medicine. Mm. Like um so um in terms of I share sometimes content on my LinkedIn and there's uh, yeah, you have great guests already as well in, in the, um, in your show that I've been hearing uh, for a while. And the, so I think it's just a matter of, of being curious of questioning our practices and ourselves, not only practice and not, and don't see, you know, like for me, it's also important to, to think that, Yes, our work or for our practices, it's it's our work. It's not everything that we are, but it is personal at the same time. So it's not, it's not, I use a lot of weaving analogies. So in our whole fabric, textile, a thread of our lives is our work or our design practice, but also who we are and the worldview we bring. So everything is intertwined at the same time. So. We need to explore this and be aware of these things uh, more. And I uh, don't think that that will only benefit your work, but also your personal life, your family life. So uh, that's maybe a general, a general good piece of advice uh, to explore. Diana, um, if you could summarize our conversation in one sentence, I know it's hard, but what would you say? It was a nice dialogue. It's a dialogue at the end because um, we thought we sometimes we think about communication or we think that we communicate, but sometimes it's more than what we want to say rather than we want to hear and really a two way flow of talking. So I think, a, like, summary 
part of a buen vivir could be this start with, by this dialogue, really dialogue with ourselves, dialogue with other people, dialogue with nature, just get the, um, yeah, the earth is talking all the time. <laughs> That's a great that's a great line to uh, conclude and end upon for today, at least. Uh, Diana, thank you so much for coming on, uh, sharing uh, this with the community, making us aware that this exists, giving us new stuff to look upon Google or ChatGPT these days. Uh, I know that uh, this is going to benefit a lot of practitioners. So thank you once again. No, thank you. Do you feel that our current Western dominated perspective on design is limiting? If so, why and how? Leave a comment down below and I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this conversation, make sure to click that like button. That lets me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. It's an absolute honor and pleasure. Please keep making a positive impact. I'll catch you very soon in the next video.